So it's good to be here with you, Susie, talking a bit about your work as a psychotherapist and how you got into it and also exactly the how of you, how you practice. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps you can talk a little bit as well about how your clinical work has evolved over the years. So um, why don't you start by telling us how you first got involved with psychotherapy? Well, I was first interested in psychotherapy because I didn't really understand the ways in which we got in our own way mm. and um, particularly from a political perspective from the perspective of women wanting to change their lives and maybe even having the qualifications the economic capacity to do so but discovering that there were structures that were so deep inside of them mm. that they were almost concrete even though of course they weren't and that mm. led me to be very interested in psychoanalytic ideas psychotherapeutic ideas also the method of the women's liberation movement which is goes back 40 years was that there was the con consciousness raising group That's in which right. women gave voice to their experience mm. so that there was a precursor if you like to something that's akin to the therapeutic method even though it's not the same mm. it was women finding words to express their experience mm. and being allowed to be tentative and reflective and take things back that weren't quite right and not just have one finished product about who they were mm. yeah that really makes sense then. and um how, how did that make you situate yourself within the kind of world of psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, which, um, as, a, as a feminist, a long-time feminist, you know, how did you find your place in that? Well, I'm not sure that we ever did find our place mm -hmm. there. I, I think when we opened the Women's Therapy Centre, which was in 1976, and we were just besieged, that's maybe the wrong word, but many, many women wanted to come, mm -hmm. with or without their partners, mm -hmm but essentially come and talk and these are women from all different backgrounds mm. class backgrounds and with or without political awareness mm. there would be women who'd been in mental hospitals there'd be women who'd been in women's groups and really were looking for therapy but then there were women who just women's therapy centre that sounds nice you know and so we had so many women coming to see us and the other therapy organisations were really hidden behind closed doors. Mm. And I remember one time the Institute of Psychoanalysis calling up and saying, if you need to um, refer anybody, would you refer to our clinic? Since at that point in history, our ideas were very different than conventional psychoanalytic ideas, mm. it was interesting to consider because those pl that place, the Tavistock, were not accessible and there were very few other organisations at the time. Not accessible in terms of money or in terms of... People knowing about right. them. And, I, I mean, let me give you an example. A, a, a friend of mine who was a counsellor, Camden counsellor in the 70s, maybe even in the 80s, went to the Tavistock not for therapy, but for to discuss funding and the executives talking to her didn't talk they gave her what essentially was a stress interview oh. so even if you knew where to go it wasn't in those days that you were invited to like well how can i help mm. or tell me what's on your mind or so i think it was at two levels it was both hidden well it was three levels hidden economic and not welcoming. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. And I mean, this this question is maybe not as sort of simple as it sounds, but if you could describe how you conceive of what it is you're doing in therapy, how how would you describe that? Well, I suppose I could say that. Well, first of all, nobody comes unless they're suffering, mm. and they may or may not have words for it, mm. and. So my job is to try to help them find a way to transform the shape of their suffering and how it's living inside of them or outside of them. 
mm. so that it can so that they can be with themselves in a different kind of way and get interested in themselves mm. and see who they are as being absolutely unique but of a less fixed proposition less determinist if you like now, these aren't words I would necessarily say in the session mm. um, about their own self their own relation to self so I would hope that they'd come to see a much more complex view of who they were. Yeah, that, that, really, that really rings true. And it reminds me of something I was just reading, an article that you wrote in the RSA magazine. Mm -hmm. And it says that, um, I wrote it down, you know, that people come hoping for relief mm -hmm. from their symptoms, but that paradoxically what gives them relief is, is a recognition of the legitimacy of their feelings as well as sort of getting away from those feelings, mm. so that, that seems to talk to what you've just said, thanks, yeah. And um, the, the other book I've been studying and preparing for the interview with you is um, The Impossibility of Sex, mm -hmm. where you talk a lot about the practice of, of psychotherapy and about how you practice, and particularly about the impact on you mm -hmm. or on the therapist um, in terms of bodily sensations, emotion, countertransference, and I wondered if you could say a bit more about, about that and sort of describe for our viewers how you ex how you use the countertransference in your work? Well, it isn't even a question of how I use the countertransference because it's who I am with any particular person, whether it's you mm. or somebody sitting in my consulting room in a purposeful way, right? Mm. I'm going to have a lot of reactions, mm. Mm. just as you're going to have a lot of reactions For to sure. me. And we're going to create something together, aren't we? Mm. Mm -mm. And the difference with therapy is that we reflect on the impact of the other on us and how we experience ourselves with that other person. Mm. Yes. Who's the, who's the, what's the part of me that comes forth, right? Mm. With somebody I was talking with today, she really had me in fits of hysterics. And with her, there's a part of me that's quite funny, right? In a way that it wouldn't be the case with somebody else, which isn't to say that I can't be funny, I can. Obviously, it's part of me. But it wouldn't occur in another relationship in the consulting room. But it's very, very much part of what happens with her. Mm. And it's not that it's of any less psychological significance, that form of contact and what is transmitted in that humour. Mm. So when we talk about countertransference, it's a technical term and it's a useful term, but really it's that totality of the how I'm impacted on and, the, and the, the bits of me that come forward in that relationship. And then what I might want to think about in relation to, well, okay, what's, what are we engaged in here together? What are we doing? What are you... What are we showing each other? What are you showing me? I, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't say these things. These mm. are the things I'd be thinking. You'd be thinking about inside. What's being shown me about the nature of the relationship configurations and possibilities you have inside of you? And where are we stretching those envelopes? And what are we making possible between us? Mm. But I'd always be thinking about that inside of myself. So... You know, you refer in the book to sometimes having uh, quite a strong physical reactions mm -hmm. to people that you then have to go away in a way and, and allow the meaning of that to, to emerge and maybe the hidden parts of the patient that that's speaking to or that that's addressing. And I, I, I mean, it's, it's to me when I was reading that, it's such, that's the magical part of therapy in a way. I don't know if it, you'd call it magical, but it's, um, it's very mysterious to the outside how that happens. Well, we've got this word, haven't we, countertransference. Mm. So if you feel depressed after a session or empty, or all of a sudden your physical gait changes, or mm. you feel um, covered in dandruff, when you actually you're perfectly okay before that session, mm -hmm. and actually there is no dandruff mm. there, and you don't necessarily know how to make head and tail of that. Mm. 
initially mm. and I think that is what therapists that the therapist is able to reflect on think about absorb transform inside of them and yeah we call it counter transference because we don't understand it but you could call it magic you could call mm. it interpersonal unconscious communication it but it does not always you don't always know exactly what it is a lot of the time you do and then you're making a comment or you're coming forward on the basis of what what has been aroused in you physically intellectually emotionally mm. and, and and feeding that back to the patient in, a in way. some way that they can actually use so you never feed back to two people in the same way even if you had the same response because each therapy relationship mm. is so unique mm. and you've got to find the way to do it with each person I think that's not the magic that is the skill mm. and that's you know that brings us to kind of thinking about relational psychotherapy and mm -hmm. um, I've heard it said that all therapy all modern good therapy is relational these days and I noticed that you're chair of the relational skill yourself so I wondered if you could say a bit more about I don't actually believe that all modern therapies are relational right. um, I don't think it's relational when you have one person telling the other what they're doing feeling hmm. um, I think a lot of therapies still in this in the UK and I would I wouldn't say this well they have an authoritarian aspect in which the therapist knows much better than the patient or the mm. analyst son. Now, I'm not saying we don't know mm. a lot of things, but it's the use of the self and the use of the therapy relationship as whether you see you are contributing to the, the therapeutic ambiance or whether you think you're providing a kind of blankness on which you then work on the relationship that's um, engendered by that. Those are two really different mm. notions. Mm. And let's say you have one set of ideas, let's take extreme um, ideas, but which are very prevalent in the UK, like Kleinian ideas. You may have a set of interpretations that you can apply to almost everybody. Right. Now that doesn't seem to, although implicit in the theory there might be something relational, that isn't necessarily in the practice of it. So it isn't that you're watching this relationship to just see how it unfolds, because you're part of that unfolding of that relationship, which is what the relational piece is. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense, yeah. And, and do you think that's something that can be taught, or do you think...? I think it can be taught... First of all, I think it can be taught theoretically, because there's a lot of work on it. But secondly, I think it can be taught through seminars, because uh, I've taught a lot of... Um, I've taught on psychoanalytic programs where there's a kind of deference to the text as opposed to an interrogation of the text mm. as though you are actually absor absorbing the canon rather than having an opinion about it. Mm. So those things are two entirely different. If you mm. teach, if you invite people to be in a therapy training and you do it from the perspective of adult education then you respect their response to the material. You mm -hmm. don't interpret everything as being a psychological issue for them. Right. So that would be one model. And then I think obviously the therapy that one has as a training therapy and the supervision mm. and the kind of ways in which that is conducted will be ways of doing it. I don't, so in that sense, so you, you, you can learn by osmosis or by watching? And by being initiated into... We're all mm. initiated into some version of therapy mm. if we're... Right? If I, and you know, I have a, 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 a dear friend who's a Jungian and I don't really understand some of the concepts, but they are perfectly apparent to him and I'm sure to everybody he's taught and everybody he's worked with because they create something together. Mm. But I don't get it, right? Despite being good friends. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm thinking about, um, you've talked, you know, about absorbing the cam canon and obviously your work with the Women's Therapy Centre and with you're, you're really well known as a social critic as well as a psychotherapist. And you've 
been very influential in critiquing women's place in society, the representation of women in the media. Um, so how do you kind of bring that into your therapeutic work? That's a really good question, because I mean, it's, therapy is not propaganda. Right. I mean, they're two entirely different, and they're not rhetorical, and they're not places for you to do that. However, what I might take up or the words I might use might indicate some sense of the individual being situated somewhere. You know, I won't say, well, of course, you know, I mean, you grew up in a particular family with a different class background, with a particular social milieu, with a particular country, with a particular, you know, I wouldn't do that because that's not how therapy works. Mm. I would rather be able to say, well, let's think about that idea for a moment. like that you're very stricken by envy, for example. Let's think about what may be your own difficulties with your longings, which you don't feel safe having or feel legitimate, and how what you're envying in the other, maybe not what they have, but their entitlement to have or their ease with having. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Now, that actually is, if you keep going, you know, that really comes out of a p particular perspective, doesn't it? Because it's not implicit that envy are, is around. It's about, it's about a conflictual situation yeah. okay. that exists inside of you. And then, to me, we might then be talking about that person's historic relationship with their mother and the impossibility of their being seen or whatever. But I still wouldn't be, it would still be therapy. It wouldn't be bringing in with the kind of strokes that I do in writing. Right. So, so for example, you, you're so well known about women's body Im mm -hmm. issues and body image. So if you were to encounter a young woman patient who um, was struggling with bulimia, let's say, um, to what extent would you be bringing in... I wouldn't need to. She'd be bringing the whole thing. Right. Okay, so she would be bringing her own I might say of... something like, well, do you think it would ever be possible to feel comfortable given what's around, right? Mm. So how might you manage that? Mm. You know, I might, I might make a throwaway about, well, they're really making a lot of money about you after, out of you hating your body. But I, I might not do it quite that way, right? I would find a way... I hope that they would know there was something else to go to in the world that they could look at. Okay, so. But if I was working with a group of young women, I'd certainly let them rip about it and I'd throw in stuff about the commercialization of the body and how much money is made out of making them feel like shit. So it would really depend on how it was going and what mm. it was. And on the context. Yeah, thank you. And then. Um, and I mean, a lot of people that I see have absolutely no idea that I write. Really? Yeah. And, you know, they can cut some nice little lady in Hamster, did that kind yeah. of thing. So I, I think, and the young ones, I mean, they don't know, right? <laughs> so it's, it's, I know it sounds like it's a wit, but I'm sure those two things are related. The fact that I do write in the world mm. and stand up and give talks all the time. And the fact that I am involved in this very private, intimate exchange. Mm. Because it's the hearing of all the stories and theorising about them that makes a much broader cultural picture for me. So they each impact on each other? each part of the work impacts mm. and informs the other. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And if you if you kind of talk about what what if you look at you know, in your bookshelves and what sort of intellectual influences have really been big for you in your psychotherapeutic practice, what how would you It's really hard to say because it's a long time. I suppose from within the therapy world, because I ended up in England at a particular moment, mm. um, I, and I, I was very drawn to Fairburn's work mm. and, and Winnicott's work and 
um, the work of the Balint and mm. the Sandlers yeah. and so that I was drawn to that in England mm. okay um, but everything had to be I think what Louise Eichenbaum and I who wrote several books together and mm. created the Women's Therapy Centre here and in the Institute in New York was that we were always having to think through the, what we were reading through a different lens through a feminist, through a feminist lens, or not even only a fem- I mean a gendered lens I would mm. say because masculinity is also a highly problematic mm. um, identity th- issue as well as issues a bit too small a word for it um, as well as what we understood from our understandings of the economic basis of society so uh, it wasn't it wasn't like oh gosh that really hits the spot it might hit the spot in terms of a description of aspects of psychic structure or particular cases then I think there was the drift to America when the relational school, which didn't really have a name relational school, in the mid-80s started Mm -hmm. with relational approaches to psychoanalysis. And of course the human potential movement and was all doing the same thing too. And um, so I, I had loads of objections there because they didn't think it was sufficiently gender sensitive but I also thought it was in those days and I don't think this would be true now I think it was um, it would ask the kind I remember it sort of being common to ask questions like well what do you want whereas for me what I saw in the consulting rooms people not actually knowing what they want and not knowing what you want, being a psychological advance as opposed to defending against what you didn't know by knowing, right? Mm. So there were ways in which the um, both the exuberance and the transparency of humanistic human potential therapy was really attractive to mm. me. And the marking out of different parts of oneself in gestalt therapy and the so on. Christian work and so on. Yeah. So that makes it sound like I'm very eclectic. I'm not in the least bit eclectic, but those were the early influences. Why are you not eclectic? I, I'm just not that kind of person. I, I have to have my own particular theory of mind and body in play, like a grammar, no different than a set of arithmetical computations in order for me to make some sense of things. It doesn't mean I can't stretch it. And draw from different... Mm. Yeah, but, uh, you know, just as one and one is two is a convention that helps us do all sorts of things in the world, so does having an internal picture of what goes on Mm. give me the possibility of being able to relate to the other? in a clinical sense. Mm. Yeah, sense. And if you were to look back now, and you, how, how long have you been practicing about? It's so long. I, just, <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous. What's interesting is how interesting it still is. I was going to say, you know, what do you know now that you didn't know 10 years ago, for example, in terms of clinical practice? Well, all I, I don't know. That's a really good question. I know that it continues to be interesting. And one mm. of the saving graces of this work is that you're always surprised and when you're in the process of getting to know the people you're working with they're always lovely I mean they might be impossible but (laughs) there's so much there Mm. Um, I suppose you feel a bit wiser when you get to my age but you also are you? who knows? Mm. Mm. And I wondered if, I mean, this is a bit of a kind of... I mean, maybe what I would say is this. I might understand now, in a way that I didn't younger, is that, and this sounds really snobby, and I don't mean it this way, because it's more of a developmental thing, is that it's much more 
a pro it's understandable for somebody at a certain stage in life to be passionately um, almost fundamentalist in their ideas and feelings, right? Well, yeah, they might not be able to, at that age, that's right, mm. right? But I wouldn't have thought that before. I would have thought, hmm, well, I, whereas now I know complexity is really interesting. So, so, yeah, I can see that that equips you better to work with people mm. also of all ages. Absolutely. And, you know, to really see what's... What's the challenge what's and what, the challenge what's, of that age what's the, the capacity of that age? Mm. Mm. And I wondered, sort of going, sort of sticking with that theme of, trans, of counter-transference and about, you know, which I was very struck with in your book about how strong some of those physical mm. feelings could be. I wondered, and I don't know how much you feel willing to give stories of patients or but you know, if you could give a kind of an example of, of how that's really affected you and, and a sense that you've made of an experience of counter well, I, to kind of give you as a, a well, sense Well, I've of written it. so much about it since Impossibility. Mm. Um, what I referred to recently, I mean just recent, mm. just a few minutes ago with you, was a feeling of, there was one woman I was seeing and it really didn't matter what I put on. I just felt like the oldest, frumpiest, as I said, dandruff-covered mm. person in the room. So much so that I would take real care to go and... Did make... it happen as you walked in or...? No, I just feel it's sort of in there. Mm. So it was really puzzling to me because, yes, she was absolutely gorgeous, but so are most people that you look at and spend time with. Mm. Yes, she was very well put together. And sure, I would have liked some of her flair, but that's really not what it is, right? Because I can have that with a lot of people. Mm. So, I mean, for me, it was really understanding with her what a false construction that body was of hers. It was that what I was feeling was actually something that was so both disowned and known by her mm. that needed to come into the therapy, which was the body hatred. It was almost like she put herself together, but actually there wasn't a body there underneath. Mm. And what I was left with was this defense structure, which was body hatred. Does that explain? Yeah, that really explains, yeah, that's great. And can you say anything about how you would then work with that with her? Well, if that's on the, let's say that was on the table, mm. then it would be not to go away from that, not to mm. pretend that she feels okay about her body. So would you tend to share? I might have experience? tended to share it in that case. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, I might have found another way to talk about the pain of it and just like you wouldn't say to somebody well I know your psyche is really fucked up so use mine for the moment right while you're deconstructing <laughs> yours you wouldn't necessarily say that with your body mm. but that's essentially what you're doing you're saying uh, uh, you can you can play it out on me yeah mm. Or, or they just do anyway. Well, they do, right? Yeah. You don't, but you don't say that. You mm. don't say, "Oh, well, you feel really insecure and terrible, but really, I feel perfectly secure in the room right now." So, you know, you can have an external ego or psyche sitting here. You don't say that. That's not what you say. But so neither would you do that necessarily with your body. But would you then? But I would address the body. Mm -hmm. And you would use the clues, almost like detective yeah. clues that you'd gone with. Yeah. Mm. But on the other hand, I might say what's really interesting to me is, which might be useful to us in our work, is I feel suddenly drenched in whatever I might feel drenched in. Mm. Now, is that something that you very helpfully transmitted to me so I know how you're feeling? Mm. Or is it some feeling that you are conveying to me, which is about... Um, wanting me to have a perfect body so that 
you can feel safe with a body that's much more secure than the body that you grew up with. So mm. it would depend. Mm. But I wouldn't necessarily always say it, but I might. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's helpful. Okay. But I've got several cases in, in my book, Bodies, which really focus on that and show what I did with the countertransference, mm. bodily countertransference. Bodily countertransference, yeah. If you were, if you imagine that you were starting out now, what might you wish that you'd known? It's another way, I guess, of asking you, you know, what would you transmit to someone who was starting out? See, I just really don't know, mm. because I think there's a confidence of being a beginner, mm. as well as... Mm. A, it's a bit in the middle that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. yeah beginners, beginners, okay. Mm. And once you're you don't know what you don't know. Mm. Mm. And so if you can not know what you don't know, you can have take a lot of interest and confidence and be learning and obviously most people aren't arrogant, they really, right? Mm. So you don't kind of know that for a long, you don't have that confident feeling again for a long time mm. because you probably have 10 or 12 years of thinking, God, I really understood that and then you're, and then your knowledge evaporating and then really understanding and then it evaporating and then really mm. understanding and then eva evaporating to a lesser level and then, right mm. and then you, it doesn't mm. so i'm not sure i could say except it's very hard work it's going to exhaust you initially don't be frightened of what you what you experience in the consulting room it is so useful it's not only the most fantastic privilege to enter into somebody else's life but it's going to be the clue to helping them and the big secret that nobody really talks about is you're going to get a chance to work on your own issues all the time mm. and that's going to be a huge bonus mm. so don't be frightened of all the feelings because initially it's going to tire you but eventually it's going to nourish you I think that's mm. what I'd say Nice. And do you do you kind of do particular types of self care or looking after yourself or do you find things particularly to let go of the day in the consulting room? Well, I mean, I like a glass of wine or, <laughs> or walk or whatever. If yeah, it's you sure. know, um, I go to the gym for half an hour a few times mm. a week so mm. that I move my body because mm. I in both my occupations mm. I'm sitting. Mm. Um, it, uh, yeah. I, in the olden days, before we all had hundreds of emails a day, there was probably more room oh, to go and sauté the onions or go <laughs> do things that gave you pleasure in the middle. But I don't have a lot of that time now. Right. I mean, I will leave here, just as you will leave, and there will be a bank of emails that have just come in. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's, that, and that's not to do with psychotherapy. That's, it, that's life. That's life, and it... I do think it's terrible for everybody, but I think it's really hard for us to know how to um, get the sort of ordinary spaces that, mm. that we used to probably be able to have. As a you know, big voice in feminism, really, and um, especially in feminist psychotherapy, what do you think has changed over the years in terms of what women are presenting with? And also, you know, there's obviously been the, the sort of sense of, well, we've done feminism and, and we've... Yeah, so I mean, so I, mean it's what, I think it's so cruel what's happened mm. to women. Mm. It's nothing that we fought for, my mm. generation. Mm. Because I think what we're seeing now is... What we thought was, gosh, there are all these dilemmas. And how do we handle them together? You know, how do you, how do you manage reproduction, work, love, domestic labor, mm. friendship, decoration. I mean, how do you manage those things? And there was a recognition that all of those things were interesting, difficult, and we couldn't possibly do all of them all the time. And we wanted to change the way they were done, right? Mm. Whereas what I think's happened for the next generation down is they're supposed to have it all, all the time. and it's a failure if they haven't. So it's all been reprivatized. Women's experience has been reprivatized. Mm. The very thing that was brought out has now been. So I think that has to be challenged and fought against. I think it's mm. impossible. Mm. 
Yeah. Absolutely impossible. And, you know, I noticed that you have been a co-founder of the Psychotherapists and Counselors for Social Responsibility. So are you also talking about, as you said, your privilege in hearing people's inner lives and then needing to take that back out? In, in well, I am, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of us are. And I think, I think we've understood a lot about what happens in civil society mm. and what happens in family life and the things that might make things easier. I think, so yes, obviously, and in political conflicts and why conflict is so difficult for people to tolerate and manage or differences. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to add just to finish? Anything that's particularly exciting you at the moment in your practice? Or? I, I don't know that I, there's anything that's particularly exciting me in my practice. I, would, I don't think that's... That, no, I don't think there's anything I could say, oh, right now, this is mm. what's going on. Mm. I think it's a, it's, it interests me in a sustaining way. Yeah. So, Susie, perhaps you can... What's new in your writing? Are you bringing out any books? Soon? Well, my last book was Bodies, yeah. which was really an attempt at providing a new theory for understanding the body that the body has a psychological history of its own. Mm. It's not just a dumping ground for the mind. And I'm still really interested in that, and it relates to the body count transference mm. question. But right now, you know, under the most insane schedule, m myself and two colleagues are doing Fifty Shades of Feminism yes. as a riposte to Fifty Shades. And it's not really... It's it's 50 writers, I mean, not 50 women writing from all around the world. Economists, scientists, um, writers, uh, about the different shades of feminism and mm. what it's meant for them or what it means for them. So that'll be out next March. And right. everybody's got two weeks to write their pieces. So that's <laughs> it. <laughs> so. And what's yours going to be on particularly? What can you say? I haven't written my piece yet, so we'll have to wait and yeah. see. Great. But it's coming out in March? Yeah, it's coming out for International Women's Day. Okay. And, um, yeah, that's lovely. Now, no, but there's no other, I don't think there's any other psycho psychoanalyst types in there because really you don't need to have, right, but, but it'll, I, so I'll have to try and get something in about that, but mm. who knows. Oh. I would like to encourage people to write about what they're learning and I would like to encourage them to write in um, not like the journals but write for the public write for the public or dare to write for themselves and submit it to the journals mm. write in the language that they understand and that other people understand mm. rather than hiding necessarily behind sort of technical language, yeah. technical language. okay okay